Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And yeah, the, my talk, if I can get my clicker working, hold on. Yeah, my talk is called Psychedelic Capitalism and the Sacred. And that might conjure two really different images. Uh, on the one hand, psychedelic capitalism, you know, makes me think of boardrooms, stock market flotations, uh, <clears throat> fierce competition. On the other hand, the, the sacred, the concept of the sacred, which is, for me, something kind of mysterious and delicate and powerful, and it's something that we set apart from everything else in culture. And this talk is in part about how we might save one from the other. And it's also about how we might navigate this inflection point in the psychedelic renaissance, which is maybe the most significant one in the history of the West's relationship with psychedelics in this time in this place right now. So what I'm really curious about is what a future might look like in which psychedelics change our cultural operating system rather than being changed by it. So I want to give a little bit of context first on what psychedelic capitalism is, what's been going on in this space. So over the last couple of years, there's been a huge amount of, well, comparatively huge compared to, as Amy was talking about, where it was 10 years ago or longer, a lot of interest in the psychedelic space and psychedelic science, and particularly the potential of psychedelics as mental health treatments, for which they've shown uh, quite a lot of promise. Um, in 2020, Compass Pathways, uh, a psychedelic pharma company floated on the stock market with a valuation of around a billion dollars. Then more recently, Atai Life Sciences floated uh, not too long ago in 2021. And there are dozens of psychedelic pharma companies now. And the, in fact, this is from uh, Psilocybin Alpha. This is just the ones that are publicly traded on a stock market. So, and there's more coming all the time. So there really is a kind of, um, yeah, gold rush of interest and investment. Um, I've been involved in psychedelic activism for the last 15 years or so and been really focused on this particular issue for the last year or so. Um, I've put out a, a few films around it on Rebel Wisdom. One of them is called The Rise of Psychedelic Capitalism um, and been, been just really focused on trying to make sense of it and also trying to make sense of my own feelings around it. So I'm definitely not a neutral observer in this. Um, and I, I care deeply about how psychedelics enter the mainstream. So in that whole process, I've spoken to um, dozens of people in the space. So researchers, IP lawyers, indigenous practitioners, campaigners, um, and had a live debate a few months ago with Lars Wild, who's uh, the co-founder of Compass. And I thought it might be useful to lay out what proponents of a for-profit psychedelic pharma model argue for. So often the, the argument that these companies have uh, is that a for-profit model is the best way, if not the only way, to bring psychedelic medicine into the mainstream. And that because we have, which is true, a mental health epidemic, um, that we need to have fast, comprehensive solutions for that. And the best way to do that is to raise a huge amount of money. And the way to raise a huge amount of money uh, is to have intellectual property that you can protect. Because no one's really going to invest in something that is not going to have a return in the for-profit model. And to have a return in pharma, you need to be sure that what you're investing in has as close as possible to a monopoly as you can get, ideally a monopoly. So the, yeah, and, and the, the psychedelic pharma companies tend to position themselves fairly altruistically as um, looking for a solution to this, this mental health epidemic. So skeptics of these arguments, like myself, um, uh, take issue with the idea that this is the only way to do it, firstly, um, and that I think the big thing is that the way psychedelics are mainstreamed, if they're mainstreamed in the for-profit model, they risk 
being captured by the very systems that are to blame for our epidemic rates of mental illness. So, and it's really about the incentive structures of the market, because the incentive structures reward monopolies. Um, they could lead potentially to bad outcomes as, as companies are incentivized towards ongoing care. There's, in my view, absolutely no reason to think that a psychedelic pharma model of treating depression, for example, wouldn't be incentivized to get people to come back for treatment as often as possible. Why wouldn't it? Because for-profit companies aren't set up to make themselves obsolete. Um, and so that's a, that's a huge concern that, that I have. And organizations like the North Star Pledge um, have, for example, tried to create ethical guidelines for companies in the space, um, but they've run into the problems of the game theory of it. You can ask people to be as ethical as you want, but in, the, in a system that is based on a kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog model, people will cheat. And what we'll see is the same we've seen with uh, the environmental movement is that companies will just greenwash and pretend to be, um, you know, we'll say all the right things and of course have the budget to do that, but we'll actually be, be doing business as usual. And the alternatives, I think, are really worth noting. There isn't just a for-profit possibility. There's also USONA Institute, which is also in phase three clinical trials for psilocybin for depression. And they have a not-for-profit model and a commitment to open science, sharing information. There's also MAPS, which, of course, I'm sure most of us are aware of, who've had a not-for-profit model for quite a long time. And then more recently, there's Oregon, who passed Proposition 109, which um, decriminalized psilocybin and psilocybin therapy. So instead of being a kind of centralized pharma model, they're working on how it actually looks, to ha looks like when it comes through the state healthcare system. And I think that's a really exciting model, and I think it's actually a significant threat to the traditional pharma model. Um, but by far, the, the biggest kind of uh, battleground in the conversation around psychedelic capitalism has been around patenting. And this is a big topic, and I never thought I would end up delving into the nitty gritty of patent law and it is as obtuse and hard to understand as it sounds. Um, but a lot of the controversy has been around Compass Pathways um, because their patent, the one patent they kind of, the main patent they got approved, is for a polymorph of psilocybin. A polymorph is a unique molecular structure of a molecule at room temperature, and it's as soon as it touches water or touches your tongue, it is just psilocybin, really. So it's the same psilocybin that the Mazatec have been using for thousands of years. It's the same psilocybin that find growing in the English countryside. The only thing that's unique about it is that polymorph structure. And you can patent a polymorph, but it's somewhat controversial. And Carrie Turnbull, who has set up an organization called Freedom to Operate, has spent a lot of time, effort, and money fighting Compass's patents, in particular this, this polymorph. And I see that kind of poly, the, the, the tactic they've taken is a kind of parasitic piggybacking on nature's work and indigenous wisdom. And that's, you know, that's my own opinion of it, but also legally it's contentious. How unique is it? When you patent something and you patent a drug, usually what the patent rewards is the huge amount of money you've spent taking a risk on this new drug. And psilocybin is not a new drug. It's not a new chemical entity. Conversely, if someone were to spend years making a version of MDMA that didn't have a come down, and they went through all the trials and went through all of the, the safety um, uh, hoops to jump through, and then they brought that to market, personally, and I think a lot of people I've spoken to would have the sense of, hey, great, you should have 10 years where that's just your, your uh, chemical entity because you went through that process. Psilocybin already exists, and this is where the, the tension has come from. Now, a recent uh, UK opinion from the patent office in the UK, this is just from a few weeks ago, came to the conclusion that the claims for uh, original invention on, com on Compass's polymorph are not original. Now, this isn't legally enforceable. It's an opinion from the patent office. Um, but it does, I think, speak to just how contentious uh, that, that patent is. And then, 
Uh, other concerns uh, in the space around psychedelic capitalism is that um, psychedelics, it's around access. Psychedelics could end up really just being something for people who can afford it, because it is quite expensive to give good psychedelic therapy. Also, there are concerns around the quality of care, because in a model where companies are competing with one another, let's say there's you know, five different clinics you can choose from, and their margins are being pressed, uh, it, it makes sense that they would be incentivized to cut corners for profit motive. Maybe instead of three integration sessions, they do two, and one of them is over Zoom. And then somebody else finds a way to do it a little bit quicker, and then maybe it's just in an app, and maybe eventually you, 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 like they, it kind of boils down as a race to the bottom. There's also a lack of uh, indigenous reciprocity, a lack of recognition of where these medicines uh, many of them came from. In fact, there's even a lack of conversation around it in a lot of these pharma companies. It's not even really something they're engaging with fully at all. Um, and then also, and this is something I'm going to be talking about a little bit more in a moment, there's the fact that the narrative around psychedelics changes the experience we have. And different revenue models create different trips, which is unlike anything. It's an SSRIs, antidepressants, don't have that uh, dynamic around them. And so the last thing I want to say on this framing of psychedelic capitalism is this phrase that kind of one of the kind of elders in the psychedelic community said to me when I was talking to him, and he said, it's a dirty game. And that just keeps coming back to me. It's a dirty game. It is. It is a dirty game. Um, and there's a kind of, I think a lot of people in the space feel this pain of something transformative and sacred uh, going through the motions and being kind of sucked in to the gritty, kind of nasty, competitive aspects of our culture. And while all these, this kind of battleground around patents and access is really important, um, I think it's really just the, the tip of the iceberg. And that's what I've been thinking about a lot as I've been exploring this space, is that a bit like modern psychiatric drugs, we're, we're kind of only dealing with the symptoms of what's going on. So I've been kind of wrestling with the idea of like, okay, well, what's underneath the iceberg? What's, what's, um, what's the level at which we can engage to change the way psychedelics are mainstreamed rather than fighting at the top of the iceberg, which is where anyone who has enough money is going to win? Um, and part of that is, I think, zooming out. Zooming out is the first step. Zooming out and looking at the wider whole. And... I'm going to talk about the, the concept of frames and framing and how we frame reality. Um, and this is you know, a very common idea in, in philosophy and cognitive science that how we see the world is based in a kind of either linguistic frame or some kind of cultural frame, and we only see through that. And cognitive scientist uh, John Brevakey, whose work I'm a big admirer of, he argues that psychedelics are an excellent way of taking our glasses off and looking at the frame through which we've been perceiving reality. And there are a lot of practices like this. So being able to take a step back, mindfulness is one of them, and look at the frame through which we've been looking at reality, change it, and then put our glasses back on, and then zoom in. And that dynamic of zooming in and out is like Tai Chi. right? So, And when we have a broken frame, it's time to zoom out. And this is a really ancient part of psychedelic uh, spirituality, psychedelic culture. The, the concept of soul flight, Viveki points out, is a great example of this. Shamans for thousands of years have, have you know, experienced this the sense of the soul leaving the body and zooming out, or maybe turning into a bird and looking at the landscape from a distance and seeing complexity, seeing patterns that no one else can see, knowing when it's going to rain or when the, the herds of, of antelope are going to be passing through. And so this bird's eye view and this zooming out, I think, can help us when we're looking at psychedelic capitalism and how psychedelics are entering the mainstream. Because if we zoom out, we can look at what, what is the culture that psychedelics are entering. And this is something that um, we've been exploring at Rebel Wisdom for, for about four years. You know, 
I've had kind of the privilege of speaking to people far smarter than myself who, who really take that systems view and the complexity view of the world and of culture. And one of the themes that's really come out is this idea that we're living through a meta-crisis. So meta-crisis, because it's not just one crisis, we have a kind of a, a, a series of crises. So we have uh, environmental crisis, we have uh, economic disparity, we have the collapse of trust in institutions, which are just not really geared up to make sense of the complexity of the world anymore. Um, we have a mental health epidemic. And these, these complex problems are all happening at the same time. And many people, and I'm sure many of us here, have the sense that we're kind of running out of road, right? And coupled with the meta crisis is something called the meaning crisis. And the meaning crisis is really the, the, like in the heart of ourselves and our culture, we don't know what we're doing or why we're doing it. We don't have a grand narrative that helps us make sense of the world. And perhaps one of the first cultures in a while that doesn't know what it's for. We don't have, uh, you know, well, the message we get is that what we're for is consuming. And people in, in, you know, in our hearts and our souls don't really think that's the purpose of life. And arguably, there's, you know, John Berveke again goes through a, a very long process of mapping the trajectory of Western um, culture in particular to give the reasons for that, which I'd encourage checking out. But the consequences of it, I believe, are this fragmentation and weapon is, and yeah, tribalization that we're seeing in culture. That we have a broken information landscape. It's kind of impossible to figure out what's true anymore. You go online, it's different people vying for narrative control, what Peter Lindbergh calls mimetic tribes. So there's kind of tribalism, not really bound by anything in particular. And also, I think, a desperate search for meaning, a desperate search for cohesion. I think we saw that during the pandemic. And we had like yoga teachers becoming massive QAnon supporters. We had conspiracy rampant. Um, uh, I've, I've called it the age of breach because we have this kind of global um, unconscious in the internet and new meaning systems and uh, kind of quasi-religions are formed there and then they breach out into reality like we saw with the, the storming of the Capitol building and the perplexed look on people's faces where they were like, holy shit, like, what the, I was on my keyboard and now I'm in the center of power. So it's a really weird time to be alive. Uh, as Eric Davis points out, the world is getting really, really weird. And I don't think psychedelics can solve the meta crisis, but I think a more psychedelic culture could definitely help. And that's because psychedelics allow us to, if used in a particular way, hold multiple perspectives. They, we know that they increase cognitive flexibility, connectedness to nature, empathy, creativity. So there is this incredible potential in psychedelics to, if we use them to actually come together and connect to ourselves, connect to each other, and start looking at so th these massive systemic problems. But at the same time as all that's happening, we're in this kind of narrative warfare around psychedelics. We're in this... Um, this battle for epistemic authority in terms of who gets to decide what they are and how they should be used. Who gets to decide who's sick? Should a psychiatrist decide or should your rabbi or your shaman decide? They're gonna have completely different worldviews based on what might be wrong with us. And it really comes down to the power dynamics around it. Um, so, and this is an issue I think because psychedelics rely on the cultural container that they're in to be effective agents of transformation. And if the cultural container is just an absolute chaotic mess and there's people battling for kind of narrative control, um, I don't think they, they can really have the potential they could. And that narrative warfare, again, comes back to frames. It's controlling the frame. So this is, the, this is I think, an interesting thought experiment of, you know, psychedelics are dot, dot, dot. And this is, this is the battle, I think. This is what the turf war is about. Are psychedelics mental health tools? Are they spiritual tools? Are they well-being tools? Uh, I'll talk about that in a little while. It's one of my pet peeves, that, that word. Um, and of course, they don't have to be one or the other. They can be all of these things. But at the same time, we are moving so fast 
into mainstreaming without having dealt with this, that I think that's, that's quite a concern. And there's another, there's two other concerns I have, which is that pharma companies and venture capitalists have enough money to create narrative frames to suit their ends through lobbying, through creating films, for example, through uh, just PR, getting articles out there. And then there's another issue, which is um, uh, from indigenous systems theorist Tyson Juncker Porta, who points out civilization, not just capitalism, but civilization as a whole has a habit of absorbing anything that could be a threat to it and twisting it into what it wants it to be. And right now, I think the biomedical model uh, and the mental health model of psychedelics is winning the narrative war. And I'm not suggesting that there's a kind of concerted effort for that to happen. I think it's just the way it's come into the culture. And I'm also not even saying that I don't think it was the best tactic for getting psychedelics through the door into cultural acceptance. It probably was. But there was also a, a kind of a implicit agreement that I certainly noticed over the last decade or so, which was everyone be a little bit straight, don't be too weird, put a suit on, don't say mad shit, and we'll get it through the door. <laughs> the pro and this was often called like the Trojan horse argument. And the problem with the Trojan horse argument is that I think the focus was on what we thought was inside the horse, which is the psychedelics. Get it in and then the psychedelics will enter culture. And I think what we forgot about was that, especially with psychedelics, the container is as important. So we forgot about the horse itself, the container that they're coming in with. And I think the, neat, the cultural container that they come in with is vital because they will be captured just like yoga for example, was captured. Yoga uh, you know, is a, a deeply transformative practice about transcending the self. Uh, and now it's become all about narcissism. Not all about it. There's different expressions of it. Uh, it's also, you know, if, we, if I were to go outside to Whitechapel and ask someone, what's yoga about? They'd probably say stretching, right? I really doubt most people would say, it's a, it's, it's a deep process of inner transformation and transcending uh, samsara. I just, some people might. Um, same with mindfulness. Mindfulness uh, is, a, is a practice with thousands of years of tradition, comes with a rich cultural container, which is really, in my view, a practice of learning how to die before you die. And now it's all about learning how to live to work. And so, of course, we see authentic expressions of all of these practices. You can find you have a Vipassana retreat where you get a kind of authentic um, frame and, and practice of meditation. There's many different yoga traditions, which really, of course, are about the deep spiritual transformation. But I'm talking about the dominant meme in the culture. And the, also, the difference is that these practices were never illegal. So there are different motives, different incentives when they come in, um, which I think are very different with psychedelics. So we have this ecosystem of different narratives about what psychedelics are or could be. We have indigenous views, we have countercultural views, psychiatric, we have people from the decrim movement, we have visionary art and an artistic view on it. And I think they all need to be there for a healthy ecosystem. But at the same time, we lack a kind of cohesive frame that all of them can sit within that defines what is psychedelic culture. And without that frame, I think the ecosystem is wide open for an invasive species, uh, like a venture capitalist funded pharma company who's pumping out narrative warfare. Um, and that's what, what I've become particularly interested in now. Um, and my hope is, and this is what I'm going to talk about in a moment, my hope is that if I were to go outside into Whitechapel in 20 years, and I asked someone, what are psychedelics, that they wouldn't say antidepressants. I'd much prefer that I ask them, what is psychedelics? And it hit them more like a question, what is dance? So that it kind of gave them pause. And they think, huh, well, many things, right? Something, something profound, something mundane, all of the things together. Um, and I think that's what that kind of ecosystem can create, that narrative ecosystem. And the, 
Yeah, the, you know, this is a little rant, a very short rant about psychedelic wellness and, and the sense of, and what wellness, how wellness is sold in the culture. I would also hope they don't say, oh, it's a well-being tool, because that's coming out right now. A lot of these pharma companies are trying to move into the sort of well-being space. Um, and I think that's, I, I really hope that that's also not the way psychedelics come in to the mainstream, because this kind of goop version of psychedelics as sort of like a lifestyle choice in kind of late capitalism, I think is weak trash, and I hate it. <laughs> it's the, I think it's the best our culture can come up with very often is a sense of, to, to fill in the void of meaning is well, well-being. And my question is always, what are we being well for? It, there, there's no kind of cohesive container around it. Um, okay, that's my rant over about psychedelic wellness. So, um, so, the conclusion I'm currently at is that instead of entering into a cultural container, psychedelics need to enter the mainstream with a cultural container. And as I mentioned right now, some narratives are dominant. And I think the job of anyone who cares about this, and, and, uh, or a job of anyone who cares about this, is frame hacking, to hack the frame, to widen the frame so that it can encompass all the different aspects of psychedelics that I mentioned, all the different narratives, that it's wider and more inclusive frame, more able to hold complexity. And that means, I think, as a community, consciously kind of going on a journey, a uh, creative journey, to identify like what is psychedelic culture? What is our highest vision for psychedelics as they, as they enter the mainstream? Um, and yeah, and I think part of that then brings us to the other side of this talk, the sacred. Because the sacred, I think, is a core concept as we talk about psychedelics and their relationship to the mainstream culture. Because the sacred is what we set aside, and it's what connects us to a higher purpose or order. It doesn't have to be necessary, necessarily religious, and in sociology, this dichotomy between the sacred and the profane is, is quite a a well-established one, originally uh, put forward by Durkheim. And now sociologist Jeffrey Alexander argues that this dichotomy, it, it, far from a situation where we live in a kind of society which is modernist and stripped of all kind of sacredness and, uh, uh, yeah, sacredness, it's everywhere. You know, we, we see the NHS as sacred, for example. The people see the U.S. Constitution a sacred human life is seen as sacred, which is why we don't charge a thousand pounds a pop for COVID vaccines. You know, we have a sense of what is sacred and can be set aside in culture. And psychedelics, I think, are the nexus of both because the dichotomy is the sacred and the profane. And profane doesn't necessarily mean sinful, it just means sort of mundane every day. The boardrooms, the, the business as usual is the kind of everyday mundane. And then psychedelics, for many people, represent something sacred. And for many indigenous groups, for many people in the counterculture, for many of us who've had a transformative experience with them. And these two things, as Alan Watts argued, they're two sides of the same coin. The sacred and the profane always come together. So it's not about getting rid of one and, and kind of moving on to the other. But I do think that we have to honor both aspects of it because we're playing with fire if we only think of psychedelics in a kind of uh, reductionist, materialist, medical framework. Because there's a kind of epistemic arrogance associated with that. And I don't think that either the biomedical model or the sort of Silicon Valley tech utopian Bitcoin bro model has the, is, su is suited at all for dealing with the complexity of psychedelics. Like, they cannot contain it. And I think the idea that they could, it makes me think of Goethe's The Sorcerer's Apprentice. It's like the young apprentice playing with forces beyond their control while the, the magician is out doing something else. And the, I think that could lead very easily to a kind of um, uh, what Eric Davis calls a banal apocalypse. It's this kind of sucking out of the sacred, sucking out of the transformative potential of psychedelics. So, I, I'm very interested in what it would look like for 
all of the different aspects of that ecosystem, all the different aspects and different voices and different narratives within psychedelic culture, if such a thing exists, is another question. Um, what would it look like if they could be held together by a kind of a meta frame? And this wouldn't be something that was a, um, a kind of meta narrative that everyone adheres to. It'd be more of a sense of a kind of value, and a, a value that connects a lot of decentralized different voices, but has the kind of power to have cultural influence. Um, Jamie Wheel uh, talks about this sense of like a decentralized mystery school. Right? Something that is like mycelium, that sits underneath everything, and that has a kind of, um, of power, a kind of cultural power and weight that can create a container for psychedelics as they go more mainstream. And I have absolutely no idea what that could look like, but this is kind of the invitation um, that I wanted to set out and something, I've, an inquiry I'd like to go on, and I'm really keen to find anyone else who might want to go on it as well. Um, so I think part of, part of creating that meta frame and part of creating that cultural container is looking at like what are the elements of culture. And it, it, in sociology, this is from Stephen uh, Barkin, actually, this, this model. This is the five elements of culture. Values, symbols, language, norms, artifacts. So I started becoming curious about making culture. How can we make culture together? Uh, because I don't think we have necessarily a, a culture we can fall back on. We have elements of culture. We have indigenous wisdom. We have countercultural wisdom. We have kind of an aesthetic, or many aesthetics in the psychedelic community. But I think more interesting than kind of relying on that is, is to use that to create a psychedelic culture. Um, and so I think the first step um, is to identify what are our values? What are the values of people who identify as being part of the psychedelic community? And so I'm going to launch uh, in September something called the Psychedelic Value Survey. Uh, and that's going to be a... Um, it's based on psychologically validated measures of, of values and moral foundations, um, and plus some, some other questions in there, and designed in consultation with psychedelic researchers and clinical psychologists probably take about 15 minutes to fill out. And what that's about is identifying, and I'm really curious about this because I, I, I don't think anyone really knows, what, what do people value in this whole wider space? What are the, and of that, what, if anything, unites the tribes of psychedelia? And that, I think, will be really interesting to see because core to creating a strong cultural container is a system of values. And it might be that that system of values is really hard to find. Maybe no one agrees on anything. Or it might be that there's, there's little embers and nuggets of things that people can get, we can kind of get behind as a kind of fluid, ongoing cultural conversation in the space. And then I think the next step after that is, is to kind of stop making sense and start making culture. And that, that means um, really, I think, consciously creating those norms, creating those symbols, creating art, creating stories, and, and seeing, seeing what happens. This is where the kind of the dance happens. Because right now, I feel like the psychedelic, like, you know, like 15 years ago or so, when I was like 18, 19, coming into the space, it was much smaller. And there were kind of internet, a few internet forums. It was a lot more fringe. There were fewer people. And there was a sense of sort of something, some kind of binding force. Now that it's become much more popular and diffuse, it's also very, it's, I personally find it very difficult to get a sense of what is psychedelic culture? But I think that's the thing I'm really curious to see if, if there can be a collective journey of identifying that in some way. So. And it's already happening as well. Um, you know, people are making stories. This is from, we will call it Pala, which is wonderful. I highly suggest checking it out. There's also, of course, visionary art. There is a kind of a feel. I mean, there's a feel to kind of coming to breaking convention as well. There's a feel to going to certain festivals. There's, there's something in the air. And that's kind of, this is the tricky thing, I think, about talking about culture. It's really hard to put your finger on what exactly it is. Because 
And I'm kind of arguing for us co-creating something that no one will ever see, like mycelium. It's kind of under the surface. And, but you can feel it. Just like when you go to a foreign country that you've never been to before, you kind of feel the cultural energy. You feel the, the environment. But you couldn't quite put your finger on what is the vibe here? What is the value system? What is the, the energy of this particular culture? But it's real at the same time. Um, in the same way that you could argue Santa Claus is real. Symbols can become real because this is something that symbolist Jonathan Peugeot argues. You could say Santa Claus isn't real, but if you go to a shopping mall around Christmas, he's there. There's loads of him, right? And if, if there's any, you know, any doubt around how incredibly powerful conscious use of memes and symbols is in this day and age, just look at the impact that 4chan had on the rise of Donald Trump. Right? We live in a time where, like Terence McKenna said, I'm a meme spreader. We live in a time where we're all meme spreaders, and conscious spreading of memes, I think, can be so powerful that it changes the cultural container. And I think it's one of the best defenses against capture, corporate capture of psychedelics. Um, and yeah, my hope is that we, that helps us move towards a psychedelic future that, that actually changes our culture um, and creates a more sustainable environment for us to live in. And again, I, I have this real sense that it's not something that we can find. It's something that's waiting to be created. Psychedelics heal when we work with them. And psychedelics always ask us to be, I think, in a kind of synergy with them. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of what we're being called to do right now, to kind of tap into all of that energy, creativity, potential and consciously work with it by making culture. Um, and the, the thing I wanted to end on is something that, that really keeps coming back to me as I look at this and, and kind of feel into this, which is, again, the idea of the sacred and something in particular about the sacred. Um, and this comes from the, the mystic Peter Kingsley. And he points out that he's also a classical scholar, that in the ancient world, there was a huge emphasis on looking after the sacred, caring for the sacred. In our very individualistic culture, I think very often there's a sense of the sacred looks after me, which it does as well. And we forget the humility and the reciprocity that we hear from indigenous cultures all around the world of being in this attitude of reverence and respect to the sacred. And for me, it feels like, you know, what really touches me about psychedelics is the holding, the love, the unconditional support that I feel in that space. And they never ask for anything in return, which I think is beautiful. So perhaps now is the time to give something back and to care for the sacred. Yeah, for any, any of us who feel that psychedelics are special in some way. Bob Jesse's argued for psychedelic exceptionalism. We feel psychedelics are special enough to be treated differently to other things in our culture and set aside and given a, a, an element of reverence, I think now is the time to sort of um, play and dance and yeah, see what we can create. So thank you. <laughs>